Well, first of all, I'll tell you about myself in a way. I'm Brian McKenna. I just, uh, today I just got my <laughs> grades back for my university course. I just did a Bachelor of IT. Um, so yeah, I just finished and I'm going to be moving out next year to Atlassian. I'm going to be moving out to Sydney working at Atlassian. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Haskell and going to be talking about the parallel side of it. Uh, I actually created this uh, presentation for a class at uni, so I'm just going to repeat it here. Uh, th that's why I've got October 13. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what what is Haskell like? This was from the point of view of p tools to write a parallel program. So this is what is Haskell. So I'm pretty sure most of you already know stuff about this. So it's, it's pure, it's lazy, it's strong. Um, it actually started off as a standard. Um, there was a heap of other languages that had all these features, they, had, they were strong, they were lazy, they are pure, but they, they kind of went, oh, we're kind of going in the same direction, why don't we just make an open standard for it? And the largest implementation of that is GHC. Uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation is specific to GHC. Um, so don't try looking for it in Hugs or something like that, another alternative to it. Um, and you less important to this talk, but you know, it's got some nice features in it. Um, I was afraid that people were going to think of it as, um, as kind of like a mathematical or a scientific kind of language. It's, it can be used for anything. Up here, you can't really see it, but it's, it's an actual first-person shooter game. That's a tiling window manager, that's a Game Boy anyway, that's an operating system. I forgot what that is. IDE maybe. Uh, that's a mind mapper or something, and that's an IRC client. So you can use it for anything. Like it's, it's, it's not just that domain of mathematics and that, which is what the impression I've got from it at first. Um, so that's Hello World. Everyone's seen that. Uh, factorial, recurs rec recursion, then you've got pattern matching. It's just some nice features. Um, so why would we use Haskell to write a parallel program? What, what makes it better? Um, first of all, it's, it's not really sequential. You, in a C programming like, like in C or in Ruby or in JavaScript or something, you've got sequence, you've got statements. So you do this statement, you do the second statement. In Haskell, you don't have that. It's just everything's, you apply functions. And that's how you map out your computation. Um, and following from that, you've got, it, when you write your function, it can be deterministic. So the benefit of that is that you don't get race conditions when you write in parallel code. Because you don't have two things happening at the same time and outputting to the console because it's deterministic. Uh, yeah, so in Haskell we've got heaps of different ways of writing parallel programs as well, um, which can which can bring its own benefits because you can decide which type to use and you can mix and match them as well, which is really nice. Um, but of course, uh, just because it's a functional program language and pure and deterministic doesn't mean that everything's going to run in parallel. It's you're going to have to have a parallel algorithm to express your computation. So. Um, so yeah, this is some explicit side effect. So we've got we're taking an integer, we're returning an integer, and the second one we've got an integer, and we're returning an I/O integer. So it's it's saying that we're doing some input or output. So it's not it's not pure in that, but it's expressing in the pipe that it's doing some that it's doing some input or output. So it's so when you're doing parallel programming, you can see that. The first one, you can run in parallel because they're not doing any side effects. The second one, you can go, oh, something might be happening here. We might not be able to do that in parallel. Um, and also, yeah, sequences, function application. So this looks like two, two different statements. But really what's going on is this thing here. So it's, this is a, uh, an honest function. So it's just passing in the value of this to this function. So you just can see that it's not statements. You're actually explicitly putting in the state as it goes through the computation. So, yeah. Um, at the moment, we're kind of using this explicit parallelism. So we've got threads, we've got locks, which are useful, but they're not the nicest way to do parallel programming. So people have been trying to come up with implicit languages. So they try and say, this part of the program can be done in parallel. So whenever it's done, we'll just do it in parallel. Um, and we've got semi-implicit, so you can say, do something in parallel, but you're not saying how you're going to do it, so you don't define threads, you don't define anything else. But here's um, explicit in Java, so you're creating a thread, starting a thread, joining a thread. Same thing in Closure, so that's just 
you can write using threads in a functional language. It's not it's not just one way. It's not just object oriented that you can write threading. Um, and this is semi implicit. So we've got a got a parallel for loop. So we're saying that we want to do that in parallel, but we're not saying how we're going to do that in parallel. We're not saying start up a thread, start up another thread, start up another thread, and do this computation. We're just doing, we're just saying parallel for loop. So it's pretty, pretty nice. And this is a program language that probably no one's ever called Nestle. And it's, um, the benefit of this is that in Nestle, list comprehensions are done in parallel. So we, we, this is just parallel quick sort. So we're putting lesser in a bucket, equal in a bucket, greater in a bucket. And this is a um, list comprehension here. So we're running the quick sort function over these two buckets. So you can see how it's kind of doing parallel as levels. So yeah, that's an implicit way. Because we're not saying anywhere to do this in parallel. It's just we're doing list comprehension. And list comprehensions are in parallel in this language. Um, yeah, so Haskell has all, all of those, really. Like, um, you can go from semi-implicit to implicit to explicit. It's it's really up to you. So I'm going to go through it, every type every type that Haskell supports. So I'm going to go through Fire and PC, which probably a couple of people out here have um, have used before. Um, strategies that build up on top of those. Uh, a couple of extensions to GHC to try and um, get some implicit concurrency in there and explicit. So that's like your threading and that. So you can still do threading in Haskell. So this is the semi-implicit side. So this is a sequential um, quick sort. So you can see that we're getting less than putting a bucket, greater than putting another bucket. And then we're just appending the two lists together and returning it. So it's doing it in sequence because this quick sort is just running in that bucket and this quick sort is just running in that bucket. So it does, it's probably do this one first and then we'll do that one. So we're just doing sequence, but all we have to do is add in that line up the top, import the parallel library, and then we just add this. That's all we have to do, and it becomes parallel, which is really nice. So I'll show you. It's that's the difference. So what we're doing is we're saying do the less than in parallel to the greater than, and then sequentially we'll do this part. So how does that work? It works by creating a spark, which is a green thread. Um, it goes and puts that onto, it could be put onto a OS thread, but it kind of, I guess it does it non-blockingly. It doesn't spawn off a thread and start it. It kind of says, okay, we'll go and, we might go and do that later on. And then PSEQ, we use it to force evaluation of B before it starts the other side. So the benefit is you run A in parallel to B and then you wait until B's finished to do that. And I thought I thought for a while, why would you want to do that? Why if B is one, then what's the benefit of, of waiting for B? Because A's not going to be finished by that time. Like if A's a, if A's calculating pi, B is equal to one, then evaluating that, like blocking on B means that it's not going to finish it's not going to wait for A to finish. And I thought when it goes to A plus B, isn't it just gonna isn't it just gonna um, wait for A to finish? Like so it's gonna calculate B already and it's gonna wait for A. Well that's I, I was wrong, it's it actually spawns off A or oh, it doesn't it sorry. It if using this PC we have, it means that we wait for B to finish and that should give it A enough time to respond to a thread because it doesn't happen immediately. So we have to have PSEQ and we have to have a B to be something that is slightly computationally intense so that A can get spawned off or can get put onto a real thread because it doesn't happen, it, there's no guarantee that A is going to go into a thread. It's just we're making a green thread out of it and that's the only, um, that's the only guarantee that we're making get a green thread. So yeah, you need to have B as something that's slightly computationally intensive and then you have to wait for it so that A can get put onto a thread. <laughs> How do you wake it up? Right. 
What's the associativity of that expression? Um, the brackets around the A part B or the brackets around the yeah that. So that's the case when A will always be evaluated. Look at the dog. at some point to use A and B. So whether whether that's happening because of the third P sec or whether that's happening because it just hits A and B and, and blocks while well, it evaluates. Yeah, well it, it will block it'll block when it gets to A, but the thing is it's not going to be doing it in it's not going to be doing it concurrently with B if, if it gets to this stage. So yeah, you need B to be computational intent so that that can be spawned off onto an actual trade. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean if if you can get rid of that, it is going to block, but you're not going to get anything because by the time that gets spawned onto a green thread, it's already going to go, oh, hey, I'm going to be, be evaluating A in a way, so it doesn't do anything concurrently, it just does it yeah. sequentially. Yeah, yeah. Alright. Yeah, I think that only makes sense to be associated, associating to the right. Yeah, you're probably right. So, building up on top of both, we've got um, par list, par list chunk, par map, and we've got heaps of other ones. They're all skeletons. So that you can just, um, they're kind of, I guess, you know, a parallel map, you can, you can tell what a parallel map is. So it's just, it builds up on top of those other things and introduces, um, introduces the abstraction already, so they're already good. Um, yeah, we can chuck in some evaluation for <coughs> So we can say whether to evaluate just the type, or we can evaluate it completely, or we can not evaluate it. So you can see, um, you can use this func the functional things that we already know of, which is maps and, and lists, and we can you know, evaluate them. We can tell them how to evaluate. Um, so yeah, why would we use this type of um, this type of parallelism in Haskell? It's because it's easy, um, they're cheap, uh, and deterministic is probably the big one. Um, they don't change your computation. I mean, the worst thing that you can do is just make it go a little bit slower by doing it, by not doing it correctly, by putting in, by telling things to run in parallel that shouldn't really be done in parallel because it's not going to give you any speed up. But it's going to make it slower because you're spawning off green threads. So, yeah, worst case, you're going to run slower. So, why not use this? Um, yeah, so be careful though. They're cheap, but they're not completely free. So, you only want to do it when. Um, the cost is, you know, greater than what, um, well, cost is less than what it is going to cost to get your speed up in a way. So, you don't just chuck it in everywhere. You chuck it in when you think it's going to be a benefit to running in parallel. So this is the implicit slide. So this is that same slide from before. Got the quick sort in the list comprehension, and they're doing it in parallel just because in this language they're done in parallel. Which just if you go back to yep. like par map, for example, which is a bit tricky because <coughs> part of the um, part of the trick with Haskell and lazy evaluation is it can be difficult to determine how the runtime will be for the evaluation runtime. Because yep. that's the whole, whole point of language is that, yeah, that you don't worry about that. Yep. that away from you. And so then choosing well, anecdotally when I was playing with this, um, it got quite difficult to choose when to actually use these constructs to force evaluation right, yeah. because you couldn't follow I found it difficult to reason about when um, the parts of the program around it were going to be evaluated so to work out whether it was going to have a, you know, a net positive benefit or not it was yeah. actually something I struggled with at the time. So. Yeah, I did too, so it's common. Yeah. I still <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in fact, with, I mean, it's really easy to type par map instead of map. I yeah. mean, I don't think the best I got was a 30% speed up. Yeah. Um, it really depends on what your data is. Yeah. So. <laughs> 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 um, so again, yeah, this is this comprehension done in parallel. Uh, so this is the data parallel version of Haskell. Now this gets a bit tricky because in the latest GHC it introduces like um, vectorizer, which can do List comprehensions in parallel. You can't see it, but 
You can do list comprehensions in parallel. Just pretend that there's a column there in bracket. Um, so it's really similar to that Nestle example where it, uh, list comprehension is done in parallel, but you kind of have to pass data in differently because the vectorizer code can't directly touch your other Haskell code. It has to go through a stage where it kind of you changing the data and you're putting like a container around it and then you have to pass it in and you have to extract it from that container. So it's it's still being worked on. But um yeah if you really need uh parallel list comprehensions then it's kind of in there. Um, still being worked on though. So is the goal of the uh, Question yeah, stuff. completely experimental. Um, I reckon the cool thing was that it's going to possibly be on the GPU in the future, which is nice. Um, I'm not covering any uh, anything else that's going to be on the GPU. Um, but yeah, so that could be pretty good. Um, and yes, I read a paper that it's only possible in purely functional language. I can't really vouch for that, but hopefully that's true. Um, this is the concurrent collections made by Intel, and it got released uh, a couple months ago, I think, probably even a year ago. Um, but it it tries to do implicit um, parallelization, but completely differently. Um, it tries to make these things called cool um, it uses different it uses a whole different set of collections and tries to use like a, I guess it's kind of message passing a bit where you're putting passing data through to collections and then mapping data, mapping computations over that data. And I haven't really had much to do with this side, but it's something that you should probably research if you're interested in it. Um, it yeah, it uses a data flow and a control flow kind of specification there. Um, you can choose heap different schedulers depending on what your needs are. Um, similar to the C++ side if you've ever played with that. Um, influenced by a language called Faisal. Um, scales pretty well. So this is the explicit side, so this is threading. Um, we've got thread falling, we've got mutable value, unbounded channels, and So they're just common things that you've probably already done with threading before. So this is just a really simple one. We're creating a, um, we're just printing out hello, we're forking to another thread that does some I.O. and we're giving it delay. So they're just that just allows this thread to get put onto a real thread and execute. Uh, there's no way to block in Haskell threads, so that's my version. <laughs> um, so this one is showing of um, middle variables. So we're creating an empty one. Um, we're forking uh, that this this function up here. We're forking it and we're passing in that that middle variable. Um, we're printing out world and we're putting it in. So that's that's another way of faking a block. What we do is we create an empty one and we're putting it and we're here we're waiting for a value. So that will block until there's a value in that new file. So that's a really simple way of creating a um creating a lock, uh, creating a locking on a thread. Um so this one is a channel. So I think on the next yeah, here we go. So we're mapping this right. Can't find that right. Oh, okay, right chan oh, okay. Right chan's good then. Um so we're writing each of those values, say two, four, six, eight, whatever, two hundred. We're writing it into that channel. And that's forked into another thread. And then this one gets all those values from that, from what have been written and then prints them out one at a time. So you can it's a channel. Here's a semaphore, singling, um, creating a new one, forking and putting um, passing it through to the other child um, and waiting for it. So we're waiting for the semaphore to reach four. And we fork fork this four times, fork this child four times. Yeah, I guess world one, world two, world three, world four. So say hello world one, and so on. And it puts, it um, signal that sum of four. And they've got STM in there. Um, so 
so they're composable, which is really nice. Not, not a lot of um, languages have composable STM. Uh, and STM, of course, gives you the ACI from ACID, so there's no durability of the memory. Um, but you've got the, all the other um, qualities of it, and they're lock safe. So creating a new um, T bar, which is a transactional bar, um, when we're creating uh, creating four threads, and we're incrementing that value by that much, and we're printing, we keep printing it until it is incremented up until that point, up until 40,000, and that's all done atomically. So there's no, there's not going to be any race conditions or anything. That's just an implementation of it. So we're reading in, we're writing it out, we keep writing it out. And then, yeah, so we're recursing and we'll just write out the value. So it's going to just keep printing whenever it's got the chance. It's just going to keep printing and reading it atomically. And then these ones are going to fall back. And obviously, there's going to be some writes when there's going to be reads. And it's going to have to fall back and do everything again. But yeah, they're all atomic and they're going to, it's going to be ensured that they're all going to. Atomically. Um, so we've got little helpers for it, so we can retry it. So if we think something's gone wrong, we can actually tell it to retry for the transaction. Um, we can check it so we pass in a ball, and if it fails or if it's false, we'll try again. Um, or else we can kind of, you know, do one transaction, or we can do another transaction. So that's yeah, like. So that's just to show that they're easily composable. Uh, and yeah, you've got the same kind of um, channels and variables on top of both. And we've also got another one, which is a, a mutable array, uh, or sorry, a transactional array, which is from the mutable array, which I didn't show on this slide. And this is um, a really nice tool for testing out your parallel code in Haskell. Um, you can enable it in the runtime and then it puts out a log and then you can read it in that log and it'll show you all the data and all the all the state that's been going through that um, Haskell process. Then you see in this thread it's done compute it's computed there, it's garbage collected there, computed there, garbage collected there. And you can see that it's done for each um, you can see you can visualize each thread and you can see how much you've got there. So you can see just above three times speed up or three times parallel there which is a really nice feature. I, I haven't really seen much else have, um, many other languages or many other frameworks have some equivalent to that, which is, I'm really impressed with. Um, so the point is that Haskell encourages parallelism uh, by kind of in, uh, encouraging um, side effect free programming, uh, by encouraging determinism and stuff like that. It just kind of helps out with um, being able to run things in parallel, um, and you can use any different. You can use these different types of parallelism. You can have implicit, you can have semi-implicit, explicit. Anything like any range of it is possible. Um, so yeah, we, all those things there. We didn't really have any locks in there. There's no, there's no threading. There's no well, there was threading. There's no locking. There was no, there was nothing tricky about it. It was all kind of composable, and it was uh, all built into GHC. Um, and yeah, threading is lightweight in GC, which is a really nice tool. Um, and yeah, that thread scope is a really nice tool. So thanks. <laughs>